ท่านเนี่ยเป็นผู้เชี่ยวชาญอย่างมากๆเลยทางด้านเอเนี่ขอเสียงปรบมือต้อนรับดรสตีฟินจาวสักครู่เสิร์ฟสวัสดีค่ะ
where we perform experiences and find out what reality is. It is mediated by our interpretation. It is mediated by our perception. I don't think that we can just demonstrate the truth of a proposition through an experiment. I think it's too easy to fake the results. It's too easy to believe we are confirming something when in fact our own perceptions have misled us. But there is a sense in which we must engage with the world in a practical way. And this is the way I've conducted my research over the years. Not by doing a study, testing 14 graduate students at a Midwestern University, but by actual engagement in the learning process, both my own learning process and the learning process of other people. I see the scientific method as being like discovery rather than being like analysis and reduction. And I see it as a discovery using language. I see language, even the learning of a language, to be like a discovery itself. I sometimes talk about learning about the world and getting an education as being similar to exploring a new city. And there's no one best way to learn a new city. And there's no one truth about a city. The city is the city, of course. But everybody has their own perspective, their own route that they take through the city. And this is important to me. You discover a city the way you discover language by being immersed in it, by putting on your shoes and going out and walking in the streets. I take photographs. And my photographs give me a way to look at things I would not otherwise see. My scientific method, if you could call it that, and in other talks I have talked about being a follower of Paul Feyerabend, who writes against method. Well, my method is to immerse myself, to interact, and always to be trying to read and trying to understand. And I've discovered over the years that education is like that too. Education is not a scientific experiment. Education is not receiving truth, but education is being immersed in a field of study and discovering what you discover. What I've come to conclude over 20, 25 years of this process, and I'm astonished that I have lived this long. <laughs> I keep tempting fate. Uh, is that knowledge is created by networks of connected entities. And this is the theory that we, we've come to call connectivism. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. You can see in the diagram on the left hand side a bit of the structure of how that happens, where we experience trees or dogs or living room furniture, and these experiences result in the growth of connections in the human brain, in the neural network. And we can spend the rest of the week talking about the process and the different ways that that happens. But the important thing is that these experiences create that web of connections. All of these experiences overlap in the same web of connections. There is not a separate representation of a couch or a puppy dog or a tree in our mind. 
they all combine in a single perceptual network. And the way I describe it is, the brain is not so much a thinking organ as it is a perceiving organ. Our brain is how we interact and learn about the world. And what's interesting about the theory of connectivity and associated theories in computer science and in mathematics and other fields is that a connective network can exist between any collection of interconnected entities. We have personal knowledge, which is the connection of our own neurons. We can have computational knowledge, and, and they talked about fields like deep learning and connectionism, which are relations between entities in computer software. If you study graph theory and, and graph databases, you're working in that field. Or it can be social knowledge. The connections that we make between us as individuals in a society, between each other personally and via artifacts, can also be a network. And that network creates social knowledge. And so on the theory of connectivism, knowledge just is the network of connections between related entities. There's, there's no taking meaning under that. It literally is that connection. That connection is formed in a human. It creates personal knowledge which is the organization or structure of the neural network. And as I said, in communities, in society, we have public knowledge or social knowledge, which is the organization of the artifacts and the things that we have in our community. These are two distinct types of knowledge. George Siemens, who's worked with me many times, working on this theory would say that public knowledge or social knowledge is an extension of personal knowledge, following the work of Marshall McLuhan, for example. For myself, I see that as a perspective, but I see these as two separate entities. And I see that knowledge in the one is recognized by knowledge in the other. We'll talk a bit about that. What's interesting is that there's a common underlying theme, and the common underlying theme is sometimes called graph theory, sometimes called social network theory, sometimes called connectionism, but there's a single set of principles and logic underlying networks a network theory in the various disciplines that study these phenomena. So this isn't stuff that we've just made up. This isn't stuff that oh, we thought, oh, this would be a neat theory. What has happened here is we saw networks being studied by people like Duncan J. Watts. We saw connectionism being studied by people like Rommel Hart and McClellan. We saw and we saw this underlying mechanism where knowledge is created by networks. And it's an important understanding that a human mind can come to know, a society can come to know, a computer can come to know, the universe can come to know. Anything that is organized in the right way is a knowing thing. So for me, learning theory is not behaviorism, it is not constructivism, or transactional distance, or any of the major theories that 
education researchers have talked about, to me, learning theory is the story of how connections form. What is it that creates this network of connections in a given mind? Or in, in any network? And of course, this is a fundamental question of education, isn't it? How do we create these? How do we create the conditions that make it possible for a human, a network, to learn? There have been many theories over the years, and I've talked about these in some cases. And there is an entire literature devoted to learning theory in this sense. It's a larger literature, in fact, than the literature of traditional education. There's three types of mechanisms that will draw your attention to that will underlie this. For example, there is what is called heavy end associationism, named after the Canadian psychologist Donald O'Head. And this is the principle that you have two neurons or two entities that are activated at the same time or not activated at the same time, that a connection will form between them. Or as it's sometimes said, what fires together, wires together. Very good. And this is a major principle of human learning through association, through similarity. Another mechanism, and this is a mechanism that's described by Rumblehart and McClellan, is called back propagation. You know it in your own work as feedback. A mechanism like back propagation works where you have a network and you send the signal through the network and you get a result at the end. This result at the end is compared with what is sometimes called a training set. And if it is correct, that information is fed back to the network. And if it is incorrect, a correction is sent back to the network. And so you do this a thousand times, a hundred thousand times with your training set, and the network learns. This is the most common method employed today in, in artificial intelligence to produce things like deep learning, IBM's Watson, things like that. Another mechanism which I personally find very appealing is called the Boltzmann mechanism. It's based on the model of Boltzmann thermodynamics. And this is the idea that things will settle to their most stable energy configuration. It's like you throw a stone into a pond. The pond will ripple and then it will settle. So the Boltzmann mechanism for creating connections is that given the input that has been and is being fed into your network, your network is always trying to settle out. And in Boltzmann mechanisms, you shake up your network and agitate it, make it really easy to form connections, and then settle it again. This is like a process of annealing, where you know, it's like the process, the, the very same process when you want to make a metal harder. You warm it up and cool it down. You warm it up and cool it down. And that's what forces it into its most stable configuration. Again, we could spend the rest of the day talking about these. There are books written about them. Uh, and and the, the main thing here is that there are theories, well-tested and understood theories, that tell us how connections are formed between networks. And my perspective is these theories and this work ought to inform our approach to education.
And so when I look at learning, I think of learning as the development of these networks. I look at learning both in the sense of personal learning and in social learning. I see learning as this ongoing process of practice and reflection, exposing our neural network to different phenomena, to different environments, to the things and the people that we want to learn about in an active way, getting feedback, and finally reflecting and allowing the settling mechanisms to work as well. And ultimately, I say that if we think that knowledge is something like this, and there's all kinds of details we could argue about, then when we say, I know, what we mean is, I recognize that. It's like when your grandmother walks into the room and you see your grandmother, and you say, ah, that's my grandmother. And you did not perform an empirical test. You did not ask a series of questions. Does she have gray hair? Is she five feet tall? Is she wearing that blue sweater I gave her? You see that wear sweaters here. Well, no, it's not wrong. You do wear sweaters here, but you don't know why. Um, you don't test, you look at your grandmother and you recognize because what you see matches your neural network. And when that happens, that part of your neural network is activated. And it's an instinctive, non-cognitive, direct process. It's like J.J. Gibson talks about direct knowledge or direct perception. That's what I'm talking about here. So in connectivism, the theory that George Siemens and I formed over the last 10 or 15 years, learning networks constitute the process of developing and maintaining connections with people and information. We connect to each other. We connect to artifacts, to books, to things, to, to machines, and we do so in such a way as to support each other's learning. In a sense, it's an intentional process. In a sense, it's a deliberate immersing of ourselves in a social network relevant to what we want to learn. I sometimes say, we learn about forests in a forest. We learn about law in a courtroom. We learn about agriculture on a farm. We put ourselves into these environments. And on this theory, therefore, learning, teaching, is not instruction. And indeed, my purpose even today is not to have you remember all the things I've said, because I'm a smart person. I know you're not going to. You're going to forget. I know that because I forget, and I'm a smart person. Everyone forgets. It's okay. What I'm trying to do is put ourselves in an environment where knowledgeable people think about the subjects of knowledge and learning, to let you think and see how I think. And a lot of the times when I give a talk, I'm actually thinking out loud, like I'm doing right now. And to raise questions in your mind, to, to agitate you, to shake you up a little bit, so that you can go back and reflect on what you already know through this new experience. The community, you, are the content of my talk. You are the curriculum. 
not me. I am the stone that is thrown into the pond. You are the pond. And you are where the knowledge is. And so what you are doing in learning, if you are learning in a connectivist way, is reacting to the input, shaping it, constructing it, reconstructing it, creating things, working with the input that you have, not just receiving it. Which takes us to the question of how. How do we do this? What are the mechanisms that we use for ourselves and for our students? And that's the subject of educational technology. And the first question is, what kind of technology do we want to build? And I've had a lot of experience with educational technologists, and the first thing they want to build is something that delivers content, right? They want to deliver a document management system, a learning management system, something that helps people create learning and deliver it. But that's the instructional method of learning. It's not the community connectivist model of learning. I'm interested in communities, and I'm interested in what might be called connectives. A connective is a network, basically. And here we have a model which shows a progression of ideas. And on the one hand, we have this model where everybody works on their own. The competitive model of education. And you notice they're not connected at all. In fact, on that model, connecting is considered cheating. that is work in education through much of the world today. And I'm not happy with that model because it represents all knowledge as personal knowledge, which is incorrect, because there is social knowledge. And we want to create social knowledge as well as personal knowledge. And we're seeing in educational technology a shift, and it's not a bad shift, but it's not a good shift, but we hear a lot of talk about collaboration and teamwork, working in groups. And this is the model of collectives. But in the collective, you can see that our network structure is very artificial. And if we analyzed it, it would look like a hierarchy. I'm running over digital space on my computer. That is not good. <laughs> I hope someone else is recording the audio on this as well. Oh well, not to me. The connective, in the model of the connective, the model is that the knowledge comes from the center and flows out to the community. And that's why you see the characteristic star shape of the connective. But the weakness of this model is that it is limited. There's no creation of social knowledge. Social knowledge is nothing more than the knowledge of one individual sent to other people. So it's better than individual competing and you can use it to organize large enterprises or sports teams or corporations, but it's limited. And it depends on an imbalance or an inequality of power and control. The third model is the connective model. In the connective model, the structure of the network is 
shall we say, egalitarian. The power law does not apply. Each person has a certain number of connections. And people ask me, well, how many connections? And I usually refer to Dunbar's number, 150. Because that's how many people we can reasonably communicate with on the basis of sending and receiving information. Now, of course, the social network is much larger than that. But no person touches all of society. And society as a whole learns on its own. An example of this kind of knowledge, this kind of, of community, is the structure of how we manage to fly a 747 from Toronto to Narita. And you notice, no single person has that information. No single person knows how to do this. We need a community of interconnected people to do this. We need people to make tires. We need people to wire the aircraft. We need somebody to fly the aircraft and preferably land it. We need somebody to serve coffee. We need somebody to navigate. We need somebody to handle air traffic control. The entire community does this, and no single person is in charge. Because no single person could be in charge. Because no single person knows enough to do everything. The internet is like that. And we see on the internet the same sort of thing. This dispersion of control and knowledge throughout the network. And as a result, the community as a whole is capable of more. And in learning, we see the same thing. One way of learning is all the students competing against each other, very inefficient. And nobody ever knows if they're right. It's like social media. You go onto Facebook, everybody's competing with each other, nobody knows who's right. right? It's chaos. And you have a whole bunch of really not very smart things being said. The other model, the connect, the collective model, is like the model of the teacher in the classroom. And that's better, but that model is limited by what the teacher knows. And I can tell you the teacher does not know everything because nobody knows everything. The third model is the connectivist learning environment. There's, there's a teacher there. The teacher is in the network, but they are part of the network. And they introduce their ideas, and their content, and their practice, and their experimentation, and whatever else they do. But then everybody else is part of that same environment. And the objective of the teacher is to encourage the greater knowledge of the community and then it is from the community that individual people will learn. That is the connectivist model. So we are trying to build learning environments. We are trying to build communities. It's very different than trying to build an online course with an instructor and a curriculum. We're trying to build a network. That's what we built. That's when George and I built the first MOOC, and you'll see this in a few slides. We are trying to build a network, a community where there are people connected together. And so the question of how do you build one of these is the same question as what is or what are the principles governing the best way to create a network. This is my attempt. It's not necessarily the best attempt. I think it's pretty good. But people can argue about it. They can argue about these things and the nature of these things. But I believe, 
through my own work that there were four essential principles. And I've seen these principles repeated by many people over time as principles of successful networking. The principles are autonomy, diversity, openness, and interactivity. And I use these principles as guides that tell me how to build my network, how to build my online environment. And I use these principles as guides when I'm thinking about the selection of technology, the organization of learning, anything practical. If you were selecting, say, Cisco network technologies for this environment, you should ask these four questions. Autonomy. Each entity, each person, each individual has their own values, their own objectives, their own purpose, and they make their own decisions. A network that supports this is more likely to be a connective network, is more likely to develop its own kind of knowledge. A network that does not support this is less likely to develop knowledge. Diversity. Each entity in the network is or can be unique. I'll give you an example. As we look at the people in this room, and most of you are wearing different clothing from each other. That is diversity. And so I can see the diversity in your clothing, and that tells me more about this community. And I see the people in white shirts and ties up in the back, looking at their email. <laughs> and because we have diversity, I can deduce that they are students. I might be wrong, but I'll bet you I'm not. Uh, I look at you and I see the different roles that you play, through the different clothing that you wear. Diversity helps me, and it helps you as a community express yourself. When I go into the old city here in Shanghai, I will see a diversity of buildings, right? And this diversity will express the community to me much better than if every building was the same. Diversity means diversity of technology. We have a network here, a computer network, that supports my Android, this uh, Windows 10 machine, uh, your IBM, your Apple, your HP. It supports a diversity of technology. It is better. Third principle, openness. People can come, people can go. I always tell people, it's okay if you leave while I'm talking, because that's one of my principles. And people have done that. <laughs> Although usually they stay in the room, which is nice. People can come, people can go. Openness is not just that. It's also a fluidity of ideas. I open myself to new ideas. I listen to what people say, and then I share my ideas with others. Very important. Openness is what allows the signal to move from one entity to another entity in the network. Openness is what allows the network to experience and what allows the network to benefit from correction or back propagation from feedback. And then finally, interactivity. This is, on the one hand, the idea that the communication is two ways. I communicate with you, you communicate with me. Even when we're talking, and a good lecturer knows this, we're talking, I'm talking, you're communicating back with me. I see you nodding, I see you frowning, I see you having a conversation, I see you thinking. You're communicating with me. And a good lecturer makes sure that they see that communication and are responsive to it. 
those four principles, if they are followed, the network will be dynamic. The network will form new connections. It will react to new knowledge. And the knowledge will be something greater than the knowledge of any individual. The patterns of connectivity that form in the network constitute what is called emergent knowledge. Knowledge that is a property of the network as a whole and not any individual in the network. It's like if you looked at a picture of a person on a television screen. You look at the screen, you recognize, oh yes, that's a picture of Stephen on the television screen. But that picture is not in each individual pixel. We don't have 10 million little tiny pictures of Stephen that make a big picture of Stephen. They're just little dots. The organization of the dots on the television screen is what results in it being a picture of Stephen. But even then, you, the community, the knower, must recognize that it's Stephen and not Charles on the television screen. If you don't recognize the person on the screen, it's not a picture of a person on the screen. So how does one work in such a network? How does one learn? How do you be a part of the network? Again, there are many ways of characterizing this. I've looked at a lot of them over time. And my own thinking is that they basically fall into this pattern, that this model that I sometimes call art in honor of Alan Jolie. Aggregate, remix, repurpose, be forward. This is what it is to be a part of a network. Aggregate, you bring information into yourself. As a human being, we do that with the senses, we, we see, we listen. You know, we're, we're like a wild animal out on the plane bringing in everything. And because we can move around, we, we move through the community and through the environment. And we're being open to all the phenomena around us. And then we remix. And we do this as a part of the social network, and, and we do this on a neural level as well. If you look at, for example, uh, David Mars, characterization of the visual cortex. You see immediately that the information comes in and then it starts getting remixed. And so you see the layers of the visual cortex do things like create two and a half dimensional sketches, do edge detection and things like that. They remix to create new information. In the social network, you take a picture from here, some text from there, an idea from there, and you remix it. People have this idea that creativity is an idea that springs from nothing. And that is not true. Creativity happens when we bring things together from diverse sources and find an element of commonality in them or find a way to have them, when put together, say something. We remix. I've remixed. And then we repurpose. And what that means is that we take this information that has been created elsewhere, and we apply it to our own purposes. There are many ways of repurposing. In education, they often talk about localization, translation of a learning resource, usage of local examples and that. 
That's a form of repurposing. It's a very primitive <coughs> form, but it's a form. I, when I work with students, ask them to express ideas in their own words. And it's not because I want to test them. It's because I want them to have the activity of using their own language to express these ideas. Because everybody speaks a different language. Even if we all speak English or we all speak Thai or whatever, we think we speak the same language, but we do not. You use a word slightly differently than the person next to you. And you use a word really differently than I do. This is something, and it's interesting, it's something that I know as a communicator. I know, I can say a sentence, Paris is the capital of France. And I mean something by it. And 200 people in this audience, 250, will hear that sentence, and now there will be 250 different understandings of what I said. That's why I don't expect you to remember what I said. You're probably not even going to have the same meaning in mind as what I said, but that's okay. That's the way communication works. And when I say Paris is the capital of France, I'm not trying to tell you something. I'm trying to nudge you into thinking of something. For my purposes. Finally, be forward. Sharing. Spreading the message. Talking to other people. Taking what we've created and putting it into the community. Interaction language. So when we built our first massive open online course in 2008, and think about how different this is from the courses you see in Coursera or edX or Udacity or the other major universities that really missed the point. We were trying to build a network and we built a massive course by design, by creating an egalitarian network so that it could grow. You notice that if you have one person in charge, that it's difficult to grow the size of your network because you are limited to what that one person does. An open network, because openness is a fundamental principle of networks. And so we made it open, we made our network open, anybody could join, anybody could leave, and we encouraged openness in content. It was not just our content in the course, we brought contributions in from all the participants. In fact, most of our course was contributed by the students. That was very useful for us because it made the cost of the course much lower. I did a study for OECD on the sustainability of open educational resources and after doing my research, I concluded that if you want open educational resources to be sustainable, they must be created by the community rather than be created by publishers or by professors. The community is what sustains the sharing of open education and open educational resources. It was online because we wanted everybody to be able to join. And it was a course, not a course in the sense of we're broadcasting content, but a course in the sense that there's a start, there's an end, and there's content in the middle. So, you think about the contrast between the big elite universities and their ex-MOOCs, and they had the perception that 
We have all the knowledge and we will share it with you. And from my perspective, that's a very regressive model of learning. It's not a model that respects the community because it's not a model that understands what knowledge is. Stanford, MIT actually did not understand what knowledge is. The MOOCs that we created, we based on community, we based them on conversation, we based them on culture. We based them on a distributed network of diverse resources, diverse individuals, and we produced more knowledge in our one MOOC than in any number of university courses, and we know that because we did the one MOOC to look what happened. Here's our design, we can call it that. This is the way we built our course. This is an actual representation of the course. Uh, it was created by one of the participants in the course. They mapped the course themselves. <coughs> and so we set up an initial structure, an initial network. We seeded it with some content of our own but we encourage our participants to create your own sites, your own websites, your own blog. And we had 170 people in our 2200 people course do that. And we took that content that they created and we shared it. And we comment on it, we didn't just share it without comment, because you know, we're always critical. And we used some software that, that I wrote called Grasshopper in order to check it. And Grasshopper is a very simple piece of software. It aggregates content from around the internet, it remixes it, it repurposes it, and then it feeds it forward in email or RSS feeds or whatever. But sometimes people talk about MOOCs and they criticize MOOCs and they say, this is an invention that's going to fail. But in fact, if you look at the criticisms, they frequently misunderstand the idea of community. They say, for example, there were too many people who dropped out of the MOOC. Well, we never created a MOOC to have them go from the start to the finish to begin with. Imagine. I went to tour Chiang Mai, which I love, because it's a beautiful city, and I was walking around, and then in two days I left the city and went somewhere else. Is that a failure? Is the city somehow wrong or improperly constructed because I did not stay? Of course not. People have lives. They do other things. A MOOC is designed to be open. You come, you contribute what you want, you get what you can, and then you leave. A lot of people attending a MOOC are just curious. I want to look at a MOOC on geology because I want to see pictures of rocks. And once I've seen pictures of rocks, I'm done. And I saw some good rock pictures, and I'm happy and the people who offered the MOOC were able to share their pictures of rocks and they're happy, that's success. It's not a model where you go from beginning to end, absorb a certain amount of content, get tested and get a certificate. That's not the model. Because that's not real learning. That's this ritual that we go through in order to get a certificate and a job. But that's not learning. And that's what we discovered in our first MOOC. Sometimes people say, the quality of a MOOC is not the same as the quality of in-person interaction. I don't There are different kinds of quality. A person-to-person -person interaction is really good for some things, but not for other things. For example, if I'm nervous in crowds, and I'll tell you a secret, I'm nervous in crowds, then it's better for me to communicate online. 
that might have at a far distance from someone is better for me to communicate online. Sure, it's nice to do it in person like this, but not all the time because I'd have to move here. And then I'd have to be online to communicate with my wife, and she wouldn't like that. Another criticism we had is there's too much content, not enough time. Because in our move, we brought in content from around the internet, hundreds of resources. But the first act of perceiving is deciding what is important. And our attitude was you pick and choose from the content whatever is most relevant to you. And you bring that together, and that becomes your perspective or your point of view. The idea that everyone must learn the same content is also wrong. It's wrong because people have diverse needs and diverse interests. And the presupposition that everyone must learn the same thing does not respect that. So some content is good for you, some content is good for you. Each person gets their own perspective and then they share their perspective. They have something to talk about with each other and that is how new knowledge is formed. If you think about it, we don't complain because there are too many cats in the world and we can't pet them all. That would be silly. We pick one, two, or in my case, four cats, and you say, these are the cats that I will pay attention to. For David Weinberger says, we don't complain because there are too many apple pie recipes on the internet. We pick the recipe that we want, and we are happy with that. And that's the way the course should work, because knowledge isn't this nice, neat package. It's this great environment that we're privileged to share it. And yes, we pick and choose. But that's what we do. And so we create our MOOC. And so we create our new technology. It looks like a network. There are people. There are different systems that might be course content, might be event recordings, might be student content, there might be text, they might be video, they might be PowerPoint slides, animations, because different people relate to different kinds of content. And then on the right, we have the diagram of Grasshopper, the application that I created that handles this and organizes it. I just want to say a few words to conclude about free learning, open learning, because this is something that has become very important. Free learning, open learning, open educational resources, shared resources, and Jerry will talk about this, and connectivism go naturally together. Autonomy, for example, requires that a person be able to access whatever materials they need without cost or barriers. It requires that a person be able to connect with other people and share these resources. And it requires the ability to join this network or that network or another network without some regard to social standards. The conditions of a network require openness. And that's why we have open educational resources. That's why we have teaching or learning resources that are in the public domain or licensed in such a way not only that we can access them, but that we can bring them in, remix them, and share them with each other. Because that's how a network works. And over time, we will find even more kinds of openness and learning. We will find open content, open <coughs> assessment, open curriculum, and eventually even open certifications. And in fact, 
over time, we will see that the community as a whole is able to recognize our learning and the recognition will come not in the form of diplomas or certificates, but in the form of job offers or contract opportunities or the means to exchange with other people. And I want you to understand at an epistemological level why openness is important. And it's this. Remember, I started to talk by talking about the way we understand the world is like learning a language, that we read the world. And a network is a perceptual system. It's a perceiving system. Our brain is a perceiving system. And people like Boulder and Chomsky and that say that the brain is naturally inclined to language. That may be so, maybe not, but the brain can certainly work with language. For language to function at all, there must be a possibility of exchanging words, of using words. I must be able to use the word belief. If I'm not allowed to use the word, I, you know, if I'm not permitted to say that word, then I can't communicate the way I would like. And there are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of words we can use. Can't use all words that exist, but we can use enough words. And we can communicate. Open educational resources are like the words that we use in education. They are like the words that we use in research and study and understanding the world. I know it's just a cat picture, but if I send you a cat picture, I'm communicating with you, and that picture is the word that I'm using. And so there must be a fluid exchange of words. We cannot have a word like a picture that is owned and you can only use it with permission. We need to be able to use all of our words to communicate as a community and again that is why that these words, these resources be created by the community as a whole and belong to the community as a whole and represent the knowledge of the community as a whole. So they've shown me the five minutes to go sign twice now, which means that it is my time. I thank you so much for your kind attention, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come and listen to me today. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so very much for your all. You know, inspiring message, and this will be very informative for all the participants. The hack on long one, the hacking tea. Professor Stephen Dow, Dai Kuhn, Hank, and Hora, who can find the hazard, Sam Rangan, the hazard, and 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 the hazard